Whoa. Okay, so here's kind of the, it's going to take us about two weeks to get through this unit on electric fields. Uh, so when you look at kind of where science started and where science is now, one of the things that they had to figure out is that how do you explain this idea of, and we're going to start with what's called static charge in electric field. And because that led into circuits and electricity. So basically, the sequence is we figure out what happens when you have electricity around like a central object, like a balloon or something like that. And what causes that and what effects we can observe. And then from there, we'll roll that into, well, then how do we make that electricity move, otherwise known as circuits. And then from there, we'll go, okay, well, when that electricity moves, that creates a magnetic field, and then, oh, we'll study magnetic fields. So we start off with static electricity. From there, we'll build that into moving electricity. From moving electricity, we'll roll that into circuits and magnetic fields. So it's, this is kind of the beginning stages of this. So if you look at where science was basically 100 years ago, 110 years ago, and you look at, this is like physics, a physics book from 1902. And if you look in the index in the back, and you try and find, uh, like, the word electron, okay? In a physics book from 1902, that word does not exist. Protons don't exist. Neutrons don't exist. The word nucleus isn't there. No. Well, atoms are there, but not in how we think of atoms. So at the time, 120 years ago, or even around the turn of the century, they had adopted the, the view of John Dalton. Okay, so John Dalton was the first one to come up with a real like working idea of atomic theory. And in his mind, <coughs> atoms were these small, almost like kind of like a round Lego block. And they were indivisible because Dalton went back to this idea of and he actually pulled the word atom from the ancient Greeks. That word means indivisible. So the atomists thought that if you broke down material far enough, that you would reach a point where you could no longer subdivide it and it still be that element. So they, they took a chunk, a chunk of gold, for example, and you say, okay, you take a piece of gold and you cut that in half. Well, it's still gold. And so their thought was that if you take a piece of gold or whatever it is, and you have this knife, well, that knife is only going to go in the gaps. It's just like the, the a running back last night in the Super Bowl. Okay? So the running back is going to go in between the gaps. He's not going to try and run into someone. They're going to run in the gaps. And so they said, okay, this will roll the same thing with this knife. If I take this knife and I cut this piece of gold in half, that knife is going to go into gaps in between the particles. And then I'm going to take that half and I'm going to cut it in half. And I'm going to keep cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. And then eventually I'm going to reach a point where there's no gaps. And I'm going to have this single solitary point that I can no longer subdivide it. And when I reach that point, that can no longer be subdivided and have it still have the properties of gold or aluminum or whatever that element is. And so that's where, the, that's where the word atom comes from, from the ancient <coughs> Greeks. So when John Dalton came up with his theory, atomic theory, he had a couple of things that were right. He said, okay, hey, atoms only combine in whole number ratios, which is why water is H2O and not H2O one eighth. Okay, you never see fractions as subscripts in chemical formulas. And that matched with the idea that, oh, things can't be subdivided. Okay, that was cool. So... In the early 1900s, you had two fundamental forces in physics. You had gravity, which they had figured out, okay? So if you look at the equation for gravity, let's, let's go old school into that. Big G, M1, M2 over D squared, okay? You're all familiar with that. We've done calculations with that. Big G, universal gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th Newton meter squared over kilogram squared. Fundamental units of mass, kilograms, boom, distance squared. You increase the distance, the force becomes less. Okay, cool. So once they began to study electric charges, 
And this is the second fundamental force, which, which is the electromagnetic force. Sometimes we call it, see, called the electrostatic force. Same idea. So this equation, this is what today's lesson is brought to you by, is this, F equals KQ1, Q2 over <coughs> P squared. So let's talk about this concept of charge. So the charge on a single electron or proton is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, okay? So just like kilograms are a fundamental measurement of mass, charge in a physics realm is measured in something called a coulomb. So okay? is, is that the Q of one electron? Is that yes. What that is? So this is, the, this is the amount of charge on either a single electron or a single proton. So but this is weird. So if, if you look at where they were in the, in the early 1900s, the scientific community was actually fairly depressed because they thought they were done. They literally, if you look at the writings of the time, they had figured out gravity. They could predict with unfailing certainty where Mars was going to be, when you are going to have an eclipse of the sun or the moon, uh, the transit of Venus when it went across the sun. They had years and years and years and years and years of data, okay? They could predict like clockwork the motions of the universe as they understood it at the time, okay? And we thought we were the only thing that existed. We didn't know about like galaxies outside of our own. We didn't know about black holes. We didn't know about white dwarfs, okay? We didn't have the technology to know those things. So, but astronomy had done some cool things. So actually, I'm, I'm reading the book now, and it's, it's, it's kind of cool. It's, it's actually on the history of longitude, okay? Which you wouldn't think would be that big a deal. So if you remember, <coughs> at some point, did you, have you ever learned latitude and longitude? Yeah. Okay? So latitude is like if here's the... Where's my glove? So your lines of latitude are all parallel with the equator. Lines of longitude go this way. So figuring out latitude was pretty simple because, like for example, you could use the North Star as a beacon. And so the closer you are to the North Pole, the more the North Pole or the North Star appears directly overhead. So if you were standing at the North Pole, the North Star would be directly overhead. So as you go further away from there and you're looking towards that North Star, that angle changes as you approach. So if you could know the angle looking at the North Star, you could get a pretty good idea of where your latitude was. Longitude was an entire different issue. So longitude was important. So like, let's say, for example, you're sailing from England over to the United States. Well, longitude is how far you are and lines this way. There wasn't any references. You couldn't use the stars. So as a matter of fact, in the 1700s, they offered a 20,000-pound prize for someone who could develop a way to measure longitude accurately. And so one of the things that they did, and, and it worked well on land but not so much on sea, is that they had astronomy down to such a science that if you looked at the four Galilean moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Callisto, Ganymede, that they could observe the eclipses and the motions of those four moons. And you could actually use that to get an idea of your longitude based upon where you were on the Earth in terms of when that became, and they had all these charts and everything. It was a horribly arduous calculation to take you like three hours to calculate your longitude based upon this. Some of them were using like the moon. Uh, and so this is, but it was so important in terms of navigation. So la latitude wasn't the problem, longitude was. So it's, it's, it's a really cool book if you're into, it's kind of boring, I'll admit. I say it's cool, but let's be honest, it's a little bit boring. But it's on the history of longitude and how they were able to measure that accurately. So the guy that, that have they ended up doing it was with a clock. But even the clock that they developed had to be incredibly precise 
because of the fact that it was based upon where that noon was relative to like London. So if you knew like, oh, I'm at a certain point in the Atlantic Ocean and it's noon at this point in time, and you knew, and you had another clock that was set with London time, then at noon, okay, here's the sun directly overhead. And so there's a three hour difference and this is why you have time zones is because the sun travels about 15 degrees across the sky every hour. So if you knew the difference in the time zones between where you were versus where you were like in, in London or whatever that reference point is, then if you knew the difference in the times, you could get an idea of how far away you were from London in terms of longitude. And so they offered this huge sum of money to someone who could come up with this idea of longitude. And so at this point, they, astronomy was cool. I mean, that's, they, they had like the Royal Astronomy Club, and they had motions of, of the planets and, and the moons of Jupiter. And literally, in the early 1900s, they're going, we're done. The only thing we have to do is tweak the physical constants, and that's it. The problem was you had this annoying problem of electricity. So they knew that static electricity existed, okay? And you've all experienced that, like especially in the wintertime, like your clothes get a little bit clingy, okay? You know, if you rub your hair with a balloon, right? If you've ever, like, in socks, rub your feet across a carpet and touch the doorknob and, and you get that shock, okay? So you all have experienced static electricity. And so they just lumped this whole, this electrostatic force into this whole idea of electrostatics, the electromagnetic force. And they knew that it had a general form of this F equals KQ1, Q2 over D squared. So mathematically, it's treated a lot like the gravitational equation is. So you have a value of K, which is a constant, which is 9.0 times 10 to the negative 9, and if there's a number that you want to store in your calculator for this unit, that might be the number, okay? It's 9.0 times 10 to the negative ninth. And if you look at what happens with the units, so you have newtons and then meters squared. So that'll cancel out when you divide by d squared. And then you have your two charges, q1, q2. Both of those are in coulombs, so those are coulombs squared. So mathematically, it's the same idea. Oh, they're both inversely proportional to d squared. They both have a constant of proportionality. One is Coulomb's, the other one is mass. And so that's why they actually thought for a while there should be like a unified theory that explains how gravity and electrostatic forces work with each other because it's the same general concept, okay? It's the same general form of the equation. But there's a couple of things that are different. First and foremost, when you look at charge, okay? We're all made up of charged particles, okay? So one of the cool things that happened when the universe formed is that you had three different charged particles, and they're all necessary for us to be here having this discussion, okay? You need neutrons because they provide the stability to the nucleus. If you did not have neutrons, basically you could not build anything bigger than basically helium. And even helium would be a sketchy because a helium nucleus has two protons and two neutrons. So one of the things we'll study later on when we get into quantum mechanics is the role of neutrons. So you had to have neutrons to provide a stable nucleus. You obviously, you have to have protons and electrons. So because if the universe just existed with neutral particles, let's say the universe said, hey, we're only going to make neutrally charged particles, we wouldn't be here. We can't build anything complex out of everything that has a neutral charge. If everything was negatively charged, we wouldn't be here having this discussion because you could never form complex molecules. The same thing if, every, if everything was positively charged. So we have, to, for our universe to exist and for us to be here having this discussion, you need all three of these. You need negatively charged, you need positively charged, and you need neutrons to provide a stable nucleus. You've got to have all three of those. I think you also have to have gravity. So we wouldn't be here having this discussion if you didn't have gravity. So if you look at what happened after the Big Bang occurred, 
the material got spread out, the universe began to cool, energy began to form, to cool down, and you began to form electrons, protons, neutrons. There was slight disturbance in the distribution of that. Some areas had slightly more gravity than the other ones because they had slightly more mass. That began like a snowball effect because the more mass that you had, the more gravity that you had, the more gravity that you had, the more particles that you pulled in. And so when, if you could see the effects of the Big Bang about the first, hundred, first million years after the Big Bang, what you would see eventually is that you would begin to see stars begin to light up. So the, this matter would coalesce. You would start the fusion process, but it takes extremely high temperatures and extremely high pressures. Hydrogen begins to form, you get helium. So that was the first generation of stars. So what you would see would be almost like in the summertime at night, where it was dark, but then you'd see fireflies begin to light up, and you'd begin to see flashes of light. That's what you would see with the first generations of stars. You would see light begin to form. You'd see stars start to pop up. So those stars went through supernova stage. They collapsed. They died. They exploded. Matter got kicked out. But that's how you made like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. All the complex atoms that make you up were formed in that first generations of stars. They got kicked out. They got recoalesced. They formed again. Then you began to make the heavier elements, like for example, all the iron that's in your blood, the hemoglobin. Okay, that all formed from the depths of complex stars. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't have hemoglobin. You wouldn't be able to have an exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in your blood. And then you get into the really massive ones like gold, silver. That actually formed from the collapse and merger of neutron stars, Louis. And that's where you began to produce even the more massive ones. So the, the, the story is, is like the universe began by making the factories, which was the stars, and then we blew up the factories, and those got kicked out, and then we built a second generation of factories, and then we blew up those factories, and then we formed a third generation of factories, and those got kicked out and merged together, and then we all coalesced again, and here we are. So we get to sit in room G20, and it's kind of a cosmic thing. We are a collection of atoms that know that we're a collection of atoms. Okay? And if you think about it, it's like, oh, that's kind of cool, right? We're a group of atoms that know we're a group of atoms. That's kind of cool. So, one of the first things that happens is that J.J. Thompson, if you remember J.J. Thompson, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. And he used cathode ray tubes, and that's a whole other story. We'll get more into that later. But he discovered that there were negatively charged particles. Okay, cool. There's negatively charged particles. That's nice. Nice. Well, obviously, there has to be positively charged particles, because if there weren't positively charged particles, we wouldn't be here having this discussion. So what they found out, and this was the, the, the and later on we'll go through, once we get into the magnetic fields, how you actually found these masses. So if you look on your yellow sheet, on the back side of that, and these numbers are going to begin to, to reference more and more. So back here on this yellow sheet, you have certain values of mass. So if you look at this, uh, uh, where's it at? The electron charge magnitude. So again, don't memorize this up here in this top right hand corner. You have 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, okay? Don't memorize it. That number is there. That's a number that you're going to use a lot, too. So if you want to store that number as Q, that might be handy, okay? Now, when you get down to here, and here's this value of K, this Wait, Coulomb's law constant. Is, is, is K to the negative 9th or to the 9th? Negative. Oh, to the ninth. What did I put? I put the, no, it's to the ninth. My bad. Oh, okay. I think that I might have put that. that. Screwed. Oh. oh, that would have completely screwed things up. <laughs> yeah, that's 9.0 times 10 to the ninth. Okay, my bad. Yeah, sorry. I was thinking, I don't know what I was thinking. Now, up here at the top, you have three numbers that you're going to need as well. Notice that the proton and neutron masses, for the most part, are pretty much the same. Technically, if you go this far enough out, there's a slight difference. But times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms, 
and then the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st kilogram. Okay? So this is an electron. So this became problematic. So how do you measure the mass of a single electron? Okay, it isn't like we can go into the lab, okay, like I've got some pretty sensitive scales that I use for AP chemistry. And I can't go, okay, hey class, we're going to take a pair of tweezers and we're going to grab an electron out of the air and we're going to put that on the scale and we're going to measure the mass of an electron. Okay, you can't do it. Just like we can't directly, we want to find the mass of Saturn. Cool. It isn't like we can send a space probe out to Saturn. We'll stop it in its orbit, put it on a scale, get the number, and then we'll put it back into orbit. So later on we get into this, you use electric and magnetic fields and basically you make the electron travel in a circle. You use the idea that the centripetal force equals mv squared over r. You set that equal to the electric field of the magnetic field that's making it move and you can solve for the mass. So it's clever on how you make that work. But here's what's important. So once they begin to measure the value of charge, which was tough, okay, to actually measure that value because it was such a small number. So this was all happening in late 1910s, 1920s, about 100 years ago when all this was taking place. So they figured out the charge on a single electron, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So what they did, and they said, okay, well, let's look at protons, okay? Well, what they figured out is that a proton has the exact same charge as an electron does. But that really didn't make sense either. So out of curiosity, somebody take 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 and divide that by the mass of an electron, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st. Let me know what you do. Divide those, you get something close to like 2,000 or something. 1,833. 1,833? So here's the deal. So what that tells me is that a proton or a neutron is 1,833 times more massive than an electron is. So if you had a balance beam, okay, like the old style balances like this, and you put one single proton on one side, it would take 1,833 electrons on the other side to make that thing balance. Okay, electrons are really, 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 really small, okay? But what's odd is that even though these electrons are much, 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 much <laughs> less massive than protons are, they have the exact same amount of charge, 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. So it's like, oh, well, obviously charge is not tied in with mass, because if charge had a direct relationship with mass, protons would have more positive charge than the electrons do. But even though the protons are much, 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 much more massive, they have the exact same amount of charge. And then you have neutrons, which are basically the exact same mass as protons are. There's a slight difference, they're not much. Those don't have any charge at all. So it's like, okay, the universe just gets weird. So I'm, as, as we spend more and more time getting delving deeper, deeper, and deeper into what happens on an atomic level, I'm telling you right now, the worst thing that you can do, and Louis, you listen to me, okay? This is especially applicable to you, okay? You cannot overlay a macroscopic thought process onto what happens on an atomic level. Yes, we talk about tiny bits of matter called electrons, okay? Do we know what they're doing? Kind of. We know they have spin. We know they exist in high probability regions of around the nucleus. We don't know exactly what they're doing, okay? So, and this is what frustrated physicists, because once they figured out that, oh, here's an atom. It's massive in terms of volume. But Ernest Rutherford came along and said, it's cool, you have a massive electron cloud. It's cool, occupies volume. It's the camera people aren't <laughs> it is the game. What do you want? You 
or just to use a little bit heads up, but I'm in the throes of a very important mess room. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, if you look at, I'm going to get a visual effect. So here's this piece of aluminum foil, which to us looks completely solid. It's like I hold this up, I can't see fish. Oh, I can't see through it. But if you could shoot and do what Rutherford did, where he used an alpha particle, which is just a helium nucleus that has the electron stripped off of it, okay, it's just a positively charged particle. And you could, if you could shoot alpha particles at this thing, number one, you wouldn't be able to see it. It isn't like they're little BBs. You can't see them. It's a single helium nucleus. It doesn't even have an electron cloud to it. And you were shooting them on this side, and over here, you had a phosphorescent screen, because that's the only way you can detect them, is when they hit this phosphorescent screen, they emit this flash of light. So over here, you would have typically like thorium-233. It's a radioactive source. And it goes through this spontaneous decay, and it kicks out these alpha particles. And over here, you had a screen. And what you would see is that almost all of those particles land over here, okay? They don't get basically no deflection at all. They go straight through here. So even to us, this looks solid. But on an atomic level, it's 99.9% .9 empty space. But it appears solid because of the interaction of the electron. And if you were to do the math, if you were to take the edge of that aluminum foil right there, and if you were to stack individual aluminum atoms side by side by side to get the thickness of that aluminum foil. So if you were to draw that big and imagine you could stack electrons, or excuse me, stack aluminum atoms side by side by side by side by side. If you stack them up side by side, it would take you about 94,000 aluminum atoms stacked side by side by side by side to get the thickness of that aluminum foil. So these atoms are exceptionally small but the mass is contained within the nucleus. So that's where the protons and neutrons are. So once they figured that out, the physics people were happy. They're going, this is cool. Because they said, we had, they had studied astronomy. These were all physicists. The chemistry people were trying to figure out how to make cocaine. Okay, Because cocaine was legal at that point. Mm -hmm. No, it was. Cocaine used to be legal. Like You could buy it at a drugstore. And so that's what they were doing. The physicists were kind of out of a job. They said, hey, hey, we'll tackle this, right? So once they figured out that it was, that you had a very, 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 very tiny nucleus with electrons moving around, they said, oh, this is going to be like a solar system. So they said, okay, just like the sun is the center of our solar system, and the planets move around there in circular orbits, they said, this is what we'll do with an atom. Imagine if they had like Twitter during this time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> <baby. laughs> yeah. Hashtag nucleus. Okay? Hashtag planetary system. So they said, okay, then we're just going to draw these circles. And this is what was known as, as like the, typically what you see is like called the Bohr model. These are all physicists. They said, oh, this is like a tiny little solar system. But it, there was a problem. Okay? The problem being, is it just like if I turn this on, okay, and I swing that around? Let me do that. That looks much cooler. It would have worked on the TV this time. Because, like, it's hard to see when the TV's up there. Hold on. Does it still go on? It's got one bit. You got it? No, it's not working. No. Wait, is it a No, exactly. That's how it hurt. So do I. That's a good question. I don't know if you can see it. Just bounce it real quick and it might turn on. Bounce it. Okay, I'm going to make the battery die. Well, that's disappointing. 
Well, batteries is like double A. No, it's like one of those really, really small round ones. It took a little. Like a washboard? Yeah. Okay. Like that small. Ooh, you can take apart a double A. That's a problem. Yeah, thanks. Uh, LR44. Okay, someone has that one. So. <laughs> Okay. I imagine that you get the light shows like you all have done had before. Whoa. Because it's going around like this, so they said, okay, which is cool. But here's the problem. The electrons are moving in a circle. Are they accelerating? Yes. Yes. Why? Because they're changing direction. They're changing direction. But here's the problem. When charged particles accelerate, they, they emit radiation and they lose energy. So if this, if electrons were moving in like stable orbits, then what should happen is that they should lose their energy, and then they should just basically do this: lose their energy, and then they should collapse into the nucleus. And this table shouldn't be here because I've been behind this table since 1994. But obviously they don't. So eventually, when we get into the nuclear stuff, you'll see that they figured out they actually travel in waves, and because you have to complete a wave function. That limits where the electron can exist because it has to complete the wave function. So, if you look at what happens with electrostatic forces, and you have this 1.6 times 10 to the negative, go away. This 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So, this is the ultimate cookie cutter factory. Every electron, every proton that we've ever studied has the exact same mass and has the exact same amount of charge, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Question being is that why? Why do electrons, which are so small, have the exact same amount of charge as a proton does, which is so much more massive? Well, what they figured out is that we can move electrons around. So, no, get that up. So, here I've got your basic balloon, put my hand up to it. There's a little bit of attractive force between my hand and the balloon because the balloon has mass, my hand has mass. Okay, there's a certain gravitational force, not much. But, wait, is that why it's, is it well, because it's gravitational? No, no, not, not enough to make a difference. There's a small amount of charge left over from this one. But now I give that a rub, and then I put my hand there, and then it kind of flips out. Okay, so what's happening Whoa. is the flight. Whoa. So as I do this, you can think of electrons, if you remember the story, as the chihuahuas of the world. Okay, there will be small little yippy dogs, yip, 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 okay, that run around. And this is going to be important when you all begin to study electric fields. Electric fields, the direction of an electric field, is based upon how a positive charge interacts with an electric field. So later on we'll go through all this math. But, it, but balloons are negatively charged. So what happens is that on an atomic level, when I rub that blanket on that balloon, that balloon was able to take chihuahuas from the balloon and they migrated over there. So what happens is that when I put my hand there, okay, on an atomic level, this is called an induced charge. So if you were to look at this, here's this balloon. And the balloon itself is neutral. When that balloon started, it was neutral. But what happened is that it took excess electrons from the blanket. So it has excess negative charge. So what happens is that when I bring my hand up there beside it, okay, so there's my hand, horribly drawn. So my hand is made up of these atoms as well. But the chihuahuas can move. So when I brought my hand up there, the chihuahuas that make up my hand said, we're out of here, because they don't like the chihuahuas that are on the balloon. So the chihuahuas migrate. But what's left behind is the anchors 
of the protons and the neutrons. And the protons and neutrons are like St. Bernard's sheepdogs. Okay? The pre showed up, they just go, oh, okay? Big, massive things that don't move. So when I put my hand up there, the chihuahuas skipped out. They said, we're out of here. Because they could move. Well, what's left behind is a small amount of positive charge because the, the chihuahua was left. So when I put my hand up here, the reason that becomes attracted to it is because those chihuahuas left, the positive charge was left behind, then that became attracted to that balloon. Now, that isn't a permanent thing because as soon as I put my hand away from that, my hand goes back to being neutral. And the chihuahuas go, okay, hey, we're cool, we're, we're back, okay? But as soon as I do that, that begins to move. Wait, now, why, why do they go away again? Because they can, because that has <laughs> excess, well, no, it's true. Because that balloon has excess electrons, okay? And so when I put my hand up there, the chihuahuas that make up my hand, because they're electrons and they can move, so what, you know, on an atomic level, what you would see is that those electrons are migrating away from them. The so there's a net positive charge that's is left it behind. Is like two poles, of, like same poles of the magnet, where, they, where electrons don't want to be near other electrons kind of thing? Don't, don't throw magnets into this. Pole, they're kind of related, but they're like distant, distant, distant cousins. Okay. Is this like okay? a dipole? But it is still true that like opposites really attract. Uh, yeah. So what yeah, happens is that when I move my hand there, okay, <laughs> So there's a small region of my hand where the electrons migrate away because, because the electrons are like the chihuahuas and they can move. I can't move my, the nucleus that makes up my, my hand. But the electrons will move, and then as that happens, the positive charges are still there. But as soon as I move my hand away, then those electrons move back. So it isn't like I do this and now my hand is permanently negatively charged. They are positive charge, just temporary. So I can do this, boom, move that. Now, this, there it is. Now, if I charge both balloons, now, one of the things you'll see is that the only way that you can make objects repel is if they have the same charge. So these very, very much repel each other because they have the same charge. So if things repel, the only way they can repel is if they are both have the same charge, both positive, both negative. But if something is attracted, there's one of two options. Either my hand is actually positively charged, or I temporarily induce a charge in my hand mm -hmm. that makes it attracted to it. Whoa. So if something's attractive, okay, there's two options. You actually have a positive and negative charge. They're permanently charged that way. Or what happens is that you temporarily induce a region that is oppositely charged, and then they become attractive. But the only way two things are ever going to repel each other is if they have the same charge. Now, do I push this far enough? Oh. <laughs> so what's stronger, the gravitational pull or the electrostatic attraction? Yeah, because that's how it stays up there. So, okay. Now, I should have somewhere. <laughs> Wait, so in that situation, are you temporarily changing your charge, or are you just... No, I'm just temporarily. It, it, it comes well, back. What's the situation where you would temporarily change it? What do you mean? The one with his hand. Wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. So... I'm sure. I'm just going to stick to it. He just goes around the classroom. <laughs> okay. That's the thing on their hands. I ruined their hair. So all this is is just a section of a bag from Walmart. Actually, thank you very much. <laughs> that, and then I got that. I'm gonna give this nice, nice charge. Okay. So when I do this, oh, 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 
like Spider-Man. Oh. That's cool. America's super powers. That is so shit. Sorcery. Sorcery. Use on a force. <laughs> Witchcraft. <laughs> she turned me into a newt. I caught that. What? A newt. Is that from like oh. the Hobbit or something? I don't know what's an animal. Oh, oh, like the salamander? Okay, so what's happened? Yeah. What do you know about that the piece of plastic? The electric force is greater than gravity. Take the charge, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and so the balloon is also... Negatively charged. Now, you'll notice that there's a balancing act, right? Yeah. It maintains a certain distance. So if I move that up, it moves away. But so, what, as that's happening, you have gravity pulling it down, but then you have that electromagnetic force created by the same charge. Let me charge everything. Hold on, I lost my electrons. Wait, what? Why is so? Why does the blanket give electrons? Because the material that it makes it up is able to take electrons from that blanket. So the blanket is willing to give that up. So do you, is there a certain point where you can't use that blanket anymore for that? No, it, it, it has so many, it has heaps and heaps and heaps. And is heaps it a and wool heaps. blanket? Yeah. Wool, wool works, silk works. Infinity electrons? Oh, man. So like if the earth was positively charged for a day, it would float? That, that got, those got really charged right now. But can it... No, we're what kind of question was that? <laughs> huh? Wait, we're neutral? We're neutral and so is the Earth. Ours are about to be fine right there. That's why lightning strikes. It is. He's in, he's in the, the north. north. Which? I thought we were positive. You're not wow. positive. Wow. Dependent. You're not positive. Okay. All right. So, we're going to stop that. Let's go to the back. What type of mirror is this? <laughs> he's convex. Oh, That's convex. what I just said. You said I was wrong. Yes. I'm just kidding. Convex. Hey, I saw a convex mirror at Walmart so, while I was working. I was so, like, oh my god, a convex mirror. If I get closer or further away, is, it ever, is that image ever going to flip? No. No, because no, it's only going to be real or real and upright. Virtual upright. Virtual upright, yes. Virtual upright. upright right? Because that light's hitting it. It's bouncing it off. That's why I look distorted. So, a couple of things you can do to see if there's an electric field. So, this is called... A, this they use aluminum foil. Sometimes we see the sun with gold leaf. And so what I want to do is I want to take this balloon. We'll start with the balloon. And we'll charge it up. I'm going to bring this close. What's it doing? So watch, watch the leaves. What leaves? Foil. Foil. Oh. Okay. okay. So when I... Bring this close, what happens? They spread apart. They spread apart, why? Because they have the same trouble. Why? Because they are both induced well, does the, electrons from the balloon. This is the dipole moment. Hold on. So this whole thing has an electric field around it. And how you tell the direction of the electric field is what happens if you put a positive test yeah. charge. So this is negatively charged. We'll get into mechanisms later. This has an excess of electrons. So if I put a positive charge here, it would go towards the balloon because the balloon is negatively charged. So the direction of the electric field is based upon how a positive test charge acts. Now, if the balloon is positively charged, the electric field would be pointing away from the balloon. So what's happening is that this thing has excess electrons. Okay? When I bring this close, that has an electric field that's around it. So what's happening is that on this, when I bring that electric field near it, those electrons sense that. And those chihuahuas want to get as far away as possible from that balloon. So their only, meth their only way to go is down here towards the leaves because they want to repel each other. So as they go down, you're getting an excess buildup of electrons on each leaf because they're trying to get away from each other because they can't. So those leaves spread apart because those electrons are being driven away from the ball down through the rod. They hit those leaves, they spread apart. So that's, so you can't sense it directly, but if I do this, and I see those leaves move, 
that tells me that there has to be something happening with that. Now, in an extreme case, if I turn this on, I then bring that close. You'll see that same thing. Oh. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so, I, oh my, wait. Hold on. I didn't see anything personally. But see how I, as I move that closer, see those moving apart? Would it shock me right now if I touched it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and just don't do Should that because you're holding the camera. Okay. Oh, but, yeah. Okay. I'll take one for the time. Oh, let me take it. Let me do it. Let me do it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, please. Please. What okay, is this so thing, anyways? Oh, oh <laughs> that was anticlimactic. Okay. So, but, so what's happening <laughs> on this van what's graph this machine generator do? is the same thing that's happening when I rub a blanket on the bloom, but it's just happening really, really quickly. So then, okay, so that builds that up. And so what happens when I touch it, that the electrons are looking for the path of least resistance. So they flow over the top of it. Now, you normally want to generate a lot of electrons. You use a... Yeah, that one looks dangerous. <laughs> okay, so this is a Tesla coil. <laughs> and if you touch that... So somebody go turn out those somebody lights come, over somebody there. Somebody come touch it. <laughs> yeah, what would happen if someone oh, touched it? With it? Oh, it just it it. shocked really, really bad. Been there, done that. I've been shocked oh. through. Have you ever been shocked through an outlet before? Oh, no. It hurts okay. pretty bad. So this is generating a <laughs> tremendous <laughs> in the toaster. I energy chihuahua. You haven't put so it in the right. Oh, I am. Okay. You touch it you kind of got this action going. It's like a zappy thing. It's what? It's like a zappy thing. A zappy thing. Send him in the hallway, please. That, that, that's a typing technical term. So what's happening is that those electrons are trying to find a path. They're going to take that path of least resistance. So as they go through this chamber, there's gas in there, those chihuahuas go, oh, this is cool. We have more chihuahuas coming through. They get so excited. They jump out of their ground state, they come back down to their normal state, and in the process, they give off light. So when I stop it, oh, everything's cool. But when I do this again, okay, Wait, so then you build that up because of the fact that that current, as it's passing through, is exciting the electrons. They jump out of their normal state, they come back down, they give off light. Louie. What would happen if you turned that on and did it from both sides? Would it would it like repel uh -huh. or would it? it? It would basically it would seek like its own balance. It's kind of like whichever one built up the most charge. So if we did that, so but because that test the coil, no. I mean like between the, the light the between what the light. Oh, light like light the light between. bar. What do you mean? Like the if light, I, the light yeah, the Tesla coil. Well, wait. Light. I thought it's like a circuit, though. You can only put it on one side, right? Well, no. It, it with fluorescents, it can go, flow both ways. Oh. So if I do this, this might. Work. Bro, why he got a fluorescent light? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, problem is, it's that there's it's high humidity, and these don't work as well. In it's high humidity it's right now? Funny, so. Yeah, so what should happen if, if the air was drier, then you'd actually I'd be able to create a spark and you see discharge of light as that went across. But Do you think electrons can have a negative effect on your health? Yeah, it's called shocking. No, yeah, like like if you just like ran this thing and then it's like you were just too close to it for a long time. No, because like if I put my hand here and I built that up, the electrons are going to flow over the surface, surface of my body down into the ground. They're not going to go through it because it's just too much work. What if you jumped? Uh. Or if you stood up on, now if I stood up on a set of books, 
then you can build up more of a static charge. That's when your hair goes, right? Yes. Oh, okay. But I guarantee you, as, as humid as it is with that rain supposed to happen tonight, it's not going to rain. It's going to rain. rain. Well, like if you yeah. put a positive with, with that thing, would it make the, the foil go towards? What? No, because what would happen, it would be the same oh. thing. If you put a positive charge, so then if you put a positive charge up here, the electrons would go up towards it, and then you would have a net positive charge down here, and they would still repel each other at the same time. Okay, got that? Okay. Now, the other thing that you can do. Watch out. So, here I've got, this is just a piece of silk. And if I rub this piece of plastic, like this, and then I rub another piece of plastic in that same way, then you'll see that those repel. But if I do this, and the glasses sometimes glass is finicky. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So if I do this, and that should actually attract, but not so much. It's heavy, so it's well. And then oh my gosh. This you can't really see now. Same thing. Wow. Uh, but what you can do, for a balloon. <laughs> Did he break it? Turn it on with it all. Turn it on with it all. Yeah, turn it on with the top off. That sounds like a bad idea. So, notice if I take this balloon, though. And move it close to that green rod. Notice that those repel each other. So what that tells me is that whatever charge that has is the same charge as that balloon has. Okay? Either both positive or both negative. I can't tell the difference. But if I know one of them is positive or negative, then I know what the other charge is. So if I do this with that glass. Oh, yeah. Get closer. Okay? So no, what happens with that glass? It attracts. it attracts. Now, one of two things could be happening. Either I actually positively charge that glass rod, or the glass rod is just neutral and it's just acting like I did, where the electrons are moving away. So with this one, you notice that that's also, that one's very, very attractive. So with this one, it's repulsive. That one, that acrylic, is very attractive. So wait, that one's... Oh, the electrons are moving to the other side? Yes. And then this one is? They're both. These are both negatively charged. Okay. So that one's being pushed away. So here's the deal. This is what I want you to, most important thing you have to get. Yeah. Just because something is attractive doesn't mean that they're necessarily oppositely charged. You could just be inducing a charge within it. But if something is repulsed, the only way that happens is if they have the same charge. So... It's. It has to be like affected to have any sort of charge. If it's like a material like that, it has to be affected in some sort of way. Yes, like you have to have a net loss or gain of electrons. Okay. Did you rub that one with the towel or what? I did that glass rod. I did. Oh, the last one. Yes. The last the, one. I, I rubbed all of them with that. Why does that one attract then? Because that's a different type of material, and that will actually, because that's positively charged, yeah. so it actually lost electrons to that material and that's why it, be, it, that, it lost the electrons to this and ended up with a positive charge. And the middle one's neutral? Yeah. And so, but it's still attracted to that just because that has a negative charge. Okay, back to you. I gotta get some of the math. What is the total charge? What is the total charge on? Is that like old Viking writing? <laughs> 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 I'm one mole so what is the total amount of charge on one mole of nitrogen gas caused by caused by caused by? What do you mean caused by? Oh, is the pen screwing up? Yes. Okay, that would explain. I hate this pen. Yes, the the pen. pen. Caused by 
the electrons. So if you have a mole of nitrogen gas, this is about like this much. Okay, so here's one mole. That's one mole? That's one mole. 28 grams. 28 grams. Oh, that kind of makes sense. So, here's the deal. Di nitrogen is diatomic, which means there's always two of them, right? So this is where this chemistry meets physics. So if you have one mole of nitrogen gas, one mole of anything contains how many particles? 6.0 times 10 to the 23rd. In this case, that's going to be... Is it molecules, right? Now, for every one molecule of nitrogen, how many electrons are there? 6.02 times... 14? 14. Why 14? Because it's a diatomic and it has 7 protons per... Uh, new, one. Do you need to like know this? Uh, huh? Yes. Do you need to like know this? Yeah. <laughs> you have a periodic table, or if you look at the back of the book. Just look at the proton, the atomic number, and that's the amount of protons. How, the like how can you not no, know how to read that? It's an atomic number. That's how you know if it's like balanced, yeah. you know? For years. Oh, dear Lord. Okay, so the atomic number of nitrogen is 7. If it was oxygen, it would be 8. If it was fluorine, it would be 9. So each atom has 7 protons and 7 electrons. So if there's two of them, you're going to have 14, 14 electrons, right? And each electron contains how much charge? 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So your moles cancel out, your molecules cancel out, your electrons cancel out, you're left with coulombs. So if you do all this math, you get a pretty big number, okay? So if you have enough to fill this up under what we call standard temperature and pressure, it would be 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules, and this is going to tell us the total amount of charge that's on all of those electrons. Now, a lot of times you're going to use, here's your prefixes, okay, nanocoulombs. No. <laughs> I hate nanos. No, nanocoulombs are cool. So, if you have nanocoulomb, if you look on your yellow on the, on the bottom, the sheet, okay? So down here on no, nano, that means 10 to the negative ninth. So if you have like 8.0 nanocoulombs, that would be 8.0 times 10 to the negative ninth coulombs. The reason why that's handy, a lot of times when we work in nanocoulombs, is because when you're calculating a force and you have 9 times 10 to the 9th, and then you have like a nanocoulomb, which is 8.0 times 10 to the negative 9th, a lot of times it works out that you're going to have 10 to the negative 9th times 10 to the 9th, not all the times, but a lot of times that will just drop out those exponents, yeah. so it, this makes the math a little bit easier. Okay, uh, let me see. So, how much time do we have? Nine minutes. Looks like it's time for nine to be over. So we had... Nine minutes. I saw So here's the difference between these two equations. So an electric field is kq over distance squared. Sometimes you'll see it written as r squared. So that's what's creating the electric field. So if I'm talking like that balloon, so when I charged that balloon and gave it a whole bunch of chihuahuas, then that would be the strength of the electric field. This doesn't tell you the direction but it just tells you the value. 
So if you look at what happens with the units, so it's that same Q, newtons meters squared over coulomb squared divided by meters squared. So the meter squared cancels out. You're going to lose one of the coulombs, so you get newtons per coulomb. So electric fields are measured in newtons per coulomb. The force, kq1, q2 over d squared, everything cancels out, and that force is measured in newtons. So the force is measured in newtons. The electric field is newtons per coulomb. What is what is a coulomb? Like newtons is meters per second squared? Uh, the, it's a fundamental unit. Just like kilograms, you can't break down kilograms, you can't break down coulombs. Is coulomb like energy? Uh, okay. yeah. Charge. Charge? Charge, that's it. It's just charge. Okay. That's it. Is it named after? Okay. What is Q? What is Q? Charge, that's just Q. Oh. Q means? Assignment. Yeah. It's not bad. What is this electric field? Yeah, a sig. A sig is one. What? How do is not bad. You can stop there. Oh, very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, no, that's it. Yay! <laughs> and whatever page that's on. Back in the game. Page 658. Oh my gosh, yeah, you lived when there was no computers. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> so did my dad. Yeah. Or cell phones. Yeah. yeah. I remember my dad's Blackberry. You, you used to have a pager, didn't you? You look like a yeah, pager I did. kind of guy. Right? I did. I had a pager. Did you? Did How long distance is a pager? How does that work? Yeah. I, I just would, like anything. Just like a phone. I really? Mean, like there's no distance? It would vibrate and so you'd get a number and that's what you, then you'd have to go wait for it. There used to be something called pay phones. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Could your neighbors listen in on your conversation? No, that's if you had a party line. Yeah. Class. You didn't yeah. have a party line? Oh, we did. I so you're, oh, I was going to say, were you bougie enough to morning. not have a party line? Well, yeah, no, Mr. Burke because, because we ran our business out of the house, so there was there was the company <laughs> number. But that was only allowed to be used for like business. And then you had the number for us kids, which was a party line. What was your business? We had, we, Who's it's a dirt construction business. Um, oh, the cat. <laughs> Wait, that's so sad. It's the bird thing. What? I was thinking of something over the weekend. Isn't there like, have you seen when oh, they spin? Bye, Gavin. Like